This is the Big Woods Bucks Podcast. Come explore the big woods and timber in North America with your host, Maine Master Guide and Deer Tracking Expert Hal Blood. Listen to Hal and co-hosts Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy as they unlock the secrets of Big Woods Whitetails. Each episode will provide valuable insights in the tried and true system Hal has used for the last 40 years to scout, locate, and hunt mature Big Woods bucks. Listen and laugh as the crew discusses Hal's legendary adventures and learn how to apply a lifetime's worth of lessons from the Big Woods to your own hunting and outdoor adventures. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm your host, host Hal Blood, and uh, sitting down here at Pylon Lodge with Joe Cruzy. Hello. And Mike Stevens. Good morning. He's filling in for Lee Libby. Lee's uh, off gallivanting or something now. So, uh, it's always Lee, something with that guy. Yeah, there's always something with Lee. He couldn't make the drive this morning, and I guess it's springtime, so construction guys have uh, a lot of work to get going on with. But anyways... Welcome, and today we got a special guest from North Georgia, Chris Jenkins, and he hunts in the big woods of Georgia, right, Chris? That's right. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you. This will be interesting because I always said, even when I wrote my first book there, I knew there was big woods in other places and then up north, just didn't really know where. So I yeah, guess it's, it's North a, Georgia. It's a pretty it's a pretty vast. Uh, Pretty vast landscape down here. A lot of big woods, a lot of wilderness areas, and a lot of really, really big mountains. So, yeah, cool. Now, I, I always define the big woods as uh, big woods bucks is is that they don't have access to agriculture because you know that's really what what controls deer in the farm country or rural or whatever when they have access to any kind of agriculture and stuff like that. So, I know there's uh, the whole Appalachian range is plenty of big woods up through there and so yeah i would say that uh that it's pretty similar down here i mean you know like like any place you can you can find some valleys that might have agriculture you can get to the edge of the mountains where you have a lot more expansive agriculture but i'd say most of the deer that uh that we hunt that i hunt um you know spend very little to no time you know throughout their life ever in agriculture and kind of human you know, really human uh, manipulated landscapes. You know, they live in wild places. Chris, when we talked to you before, just to, to back up a little bit, you mentioned you were originally from New England. Yeah, so I grew up. Um, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, um, in the you know, kind of in the foothills of the Berkshires, and uh, I was there. I went did my undergraduate work at the university of massachusetts and uh and then also went on to do a master's there and then i uh and then i moved out west to the rocky mountains to uh to do my phd and and i uh, launched my career in deerology i'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see no, one, actually one thing Chris, actually, is you're way too smart for us but we just want you to know that <laughs> Don't let it fool you. All, all a PhD means is that you know one thing really, really well, and then you're a complete bumbling idiot in the rest of life. So, oh, that means so. you can do it after all. Yeah, <laughs> we're all PhDs. Yeah, huh? I just realized that. Uh, no, I am a I am a wildlife biologist, though. But I am a okay. um, I am a herpetologist. I uh, focus on. Uh, reptiles and amphibians, and I, I now am CEO of a nonprofit that does uh, rare reptile and amphibian research and conservation all over the world. So, oh, no uh, wow. yeah, and I am in particular, personally, I am a um, I'm a viper expert. So I'm a venomous snake expert. So I work on rattlesnakes and, you know, all kinds of bush masters and, and other <laughs> insane large venomous snakes all over the world. That's kind of my personal specialty. When I was a <clears throat> when I was a kid living down in Florida, we always used to go down to see Bill Haas down there at the Miami Serpaterium. And oh, yeah. That was he was kind of legendary, I think, in those days. Uh yeah, you know, no, he, still, he still is. <laughs> oh, is that he right? In that is. world he is? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. No, and, and we spend a lot of time in Florida. You know, my organization. You may, you may have. There's a snake called an eastern indigo snake, big blue, uh, largest snake in North America, native snake at least now. And uh, they actually eat rattlesnakes and other snakes. Anyways, our organization called the Orian Society was formed 
to, to save that species. And so anyways, we do extensive, we have, I have extensive programs in South Florida, South Georgia, doing everything from, you know, we have a breeding center and facility, a facility in Eustace, Florida, where we do, we breed endangered reptiles for reintroductions and we reintroduce them back into Florida. And then we, um, and then we do quite a bit of habitat um, restoration work, a lot of um, land um, acquisition protection work, creating, you know, one of our big projects now in Georgia is that we're working with a huge partnership and we're helping to purchase and protect um, a lot of land across the, the southern part of the state. And all that land's being turned over to the state and turned into wildlife management areas. So basically we're creating a lot of new hunting ground for people in, in South Georgia. Wow. Excellent. Um, I've, <clears throat> I actually have some, uh, some family in South Georgia, so I hunt down there quite a bit and, uh, I have a little different take on the reptiles than you do. I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I do not like hunting down there for that reason. Well, Chris, I, I, I was <laughs> going to give you some trouble Joe, Cause I remember one of the previous podcasts, I heard you say something about how salamanders weren't important or something. And I'm hoping by, by the end of this podcast or we get to know each other a little bit better and I can show you that <laughs> salamanders are important too. They're, yeah. Trout eat yeah, them. Yeah. They're awesome. <laughs> awesome. <trout. laughs> uh, well, well, Chris, yeah. you know, people up here in the North ain't too fond of snakes and I don't have to tell you that, but I saw one turkey hunting the other day, I don't know, two days ago, I'm still walking in inch off the ground. <laughs> 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 and the thing was only like six inches long. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, at least, you know, you guys, as you know, you probably know, there are no rattlesnakes. Uh, there are no venomous snakes remaining in Maine. They used to have um, a few populations of rattlesnakes. And there's a couple guys that have been looking for them um, pretty diligently for a number of years now. But as far as we know, there are no rattlesnakes that remain in the state. And they certainly wouldn't be up in those extreme environments, you know, that you guys are you trouncing around in the woods in. You know, growing up, you know, spending time in the Everglades and everything, obviously we're around snakes all the time, but, but now the situation down there, as you know, is just out of control with the, with the uh, pythons. pythons. And yeah, it's so strange to me when I watched, it was really, so I left there, oh, 12 years ago or so. And it was really just starting then, um, to where it was becoming a thing. And it's, it's crazy watching the news about it, the videos. And I, I watch these guys that Python hunt and everything and, they're really doing major damage to the, the mammal population down there. Um, yeah, it's certainly. really changed so, things. Yeah. And it's a, it's an issue that, that, you know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to turn back, you know, our best case scenario is to, um, you know, is to kind of keep them at bay and keep them in South Florida. And one of the sad things, you know, circling this back to, uh, to deer, you know, is that key deer that you're probably familiar with being from down there. Um, you know, and, and those pythons, you know, if they can really get a foothold on the Florida Keys, it'll probably probably be the end of that that species. The key deer will probably end up going extinct because they're perfect size meal for a python. Yeah, well, they're doing it to just the the Everglades deer, not not just the yeah. key deer, but the population down there of of. Uh, I mean, there's been numerous. I'm sure you've seen videos and pictures and everything of of the catching these pythons with whole deer in them. And they're not, oh, yeah. they're obviously not deer like up here, but they're a hundred pounds anyway. And, yeah. uh, it's just, that would, that would kind of freak me out spending time in the, in the water and the grass. Like I used to with knowing those things are around. Yep. Yeah. No, a, uh, you know, a, a really large one could, you know, could overpower a full, full grown man for sure. If he, if he ended up, if the snake ended up getting you right. So, right. but you know, chances are pretty low. Like, like you mentioned, the biggest impacts they're having are not so much on on the people you know there hasn't been a documented death of a child or anything like that but it's it's like you said just the ecology that whole you know ecosystem it's uh you know they're they're turning it on its head for sure yeah i'd say the closest thing we have up here is a smallmouth bass (laughs) we hate them just as much (laughs) what that that and the coyotes yeah yeah what what's the thing with those those down there in the swamps they uh, they multiply so fast i mean how's that work chris uh they have a very um a very yeah they reproduce very quickly and that um an individual female you know can have a large number of offspring you know it's not that she's having 
five or six babies, you know, she's having something more on the magnitude of, you know, 70, 80, you know, she potentially can have a lot. So first of all, their reproductive output's very high. But the biggest thing is that most people don't think of this, but the Everglades, it, you know, that's the biggest wilderness, wild place that we have east of the Mississippi, you know, and, and I mean, there are other wild places, you know, here where I live in the Southern Appalachians up there where you guys live in the North woods, but you know, the Everglades, if you start looking at the size of it, you know, it's unroaded for the most part on, and it's a huge place. So my point being that, that you get these snakes into this ecosystem and you just can't get them out. And, and as Joe can tell you, it's really uh, almost an entire thing or a large portion of it. It's a sea of grass and not only a sea of grass, but a sea of grass that for a lot of the time is under significant amount of water and the snakes do well in that. So, I mean, it's almost, it would be impossible to, you know, to really eradicate them unless there was something kind of as insidious, something that would spread like that. Um, so uh, it's just, they have a high reproductive rate and they live in a place that is, very difficult for us to access. Yeah, and any time, any time we go down that road where you try to introduce something to kill the thing that was introduced, it, it usually never works out well. You know, you just starts the dominoes. Um, you know, it, it just gets worse and worse because they weren't meant to be there. It's a good point, Chris. Uh, I want to tell you a quick story about snakes. When I was living in North Carolina, I was in the Marine Corps there because we had to. We used to hunt down along, uh, I was on Lejeune, we used to hunt on base there, and it's a lot of that uh, tidal, tidal streams yeah. and stuff, you know. And, because uh, we knew there was snakes and stuff there. So, anyways, one day, me and a buddy of mine, Bruce, we was, we was kind of, we used to kind of still hunt through that a lot, you know. And, and uh, once in a while, we'd do something like one guy would stay up on a ridge, another guy would go down and pound along in the, thickets down along them streams try to drive one out but anyways we're going along still hunting kind of keeping each other in sight there and i i stepped up on this big log and down on the ground is this big cotton mouth all curled up in the sun there you know it was probably november or whatever and uh so i i jumped back and i i told bruce i said come here look at this snake over here so I had a bright idea, and I cut a forked stick. I was going to catch it, right? So I cut this forked stick, and I jumped back up on the log, and I, I, I told Bruce, I said, if anything goes wrong, shoot the thing, you know. And I jammed the stick, my forked stick, behind his head, and he started squirming, you know. He come off the ground, he was squirming. And evidently, I cut my forks too long because his head popped out from underneath the, the forked stick. <laughs> And as soon as I see that head pop out, I jumped. And Bruce told me, because he started running too, but he, he looked long enough to see the thing. He said, that thing just missed the back of my leg when I jumped down off that off of that log. I never I never messed with another one. We, we got the hell out of there. And the next, I see one more deer hunting. I was by myself, and it was a little wet thing going through the woods. And I, I look across it. It was just a little trickle, you know, two feet across. And there's another one. He's curled up on the other side of it. And I just backed up, and I went about 50 yards all the way around that damn thing. <laughs> That's it. Well, it sounds like you almost had an exciting uh, experience there in those North Carolina swamps. You know, I give these uh, I give these seminars all over the country. I was just giving one in, in Idaho where, where I met Matt I was telling you about. Anyways, uh, and, you know, we always talk about – that the majority of venomous snake bites in in the United States have kind of have one thing in common, and we call it the three T's, which are testosterone, tattoos, and tequila. Not, not, insinuating, <laughs> <laughs> not insinuating that you're drunk, but the point is, is that you know, it, most of the venomous snake bites um, in the United States they don't occur when somebody's out walking, hunting, hiking, bird watching, stepping on a snake. They occur when somebody tries to mess with one, you know, type of situation you're in there. So it's, I'm glad you didn't, uh, I'm glad you didn't get a bite from that cotton mouth. Um, but you almost became, you almost became a statistic. <laughs> a testosterone one, right? <laughs> I'm guessing it was, I don't think it was a tequila. That's for sure. <laughs> so my phone just told me it's your birthday today. 
Oh, yeah, it is. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, right. old man. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, thanks. I know this morning I get up and I keep getting it's dinging and the messenger things there. It's dinging. I'm like, what the heck's getting so many? Then I look and I go, oh, they're wishing me a happy birthday, you know. It's like <laughs> I had to shut the, the sound off for this podcast. How, how do you here. feel for 45? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good. Pretty spry. You look good. You look good for forty five, by the way. That wouldn't that wouldn't go that far. Yeah. <laughs> well <laughs> I know I was last weekend we was in remote camp. I was teaching my deer clinic there and, and uh I was showing them some of my movies, you know, the my cell film hunts. And they go back to two thousand and ten was the first one I filmed myself. And I look at myself and I'm like, that's a different guy. My my beard's still all black then. And now it's all gray. <laughs> if you, uh, it would probably help if you shaved it a little bit. My honey, li- saying. my honey likes it like that. She wants me. She thinks I'm a. I got the Viking look, you know. Oh, all right. Yeah, you know, women are into that shit now. <laughs> no, another testosterone thing. So it, it was you to discover America. <laughs> yeah. Now we know. <laughs> Jeez, uh, Chris, you meet all kinds of famous people this morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey Chris, do you happen to know in your travels down there? Uh, uh, Savannah Bone works down at Gatorland in Orlando. I do, and, I do not. What, what okay. was the name? Sorry, Savannah. Uh, she's uh, uh, pretty popular down there in the reptile world. Uh, she works down in uh, uh, Gatorland. But anyway, I didn't know if because you're in that world so heavily and you travel around a lot, if you guys have crossed paths, but. Anyway, I may have I out. may have may have met her. The name sounds familiar. I know one Savannah in Georgia that works quite a bit with yeah. reptiles. But anyways, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, we got to get hunting. to it. No more snakes. Yeah, we're this done. is a snake podcast now. Yeah, we're, done, we're done with that. <laughs> okay, ready, okay, okay. I was getting ready to tell my dear story about Southern Georgia, but I'll, I'll let it pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got that picture from you of that nice buck down there. Uh, oh yeah, that was a, last year's buck. So. Yeah, nice buck, and uh, so we want to hear a little bit about hunting in the big woods of Georgia, and maybe we'll see if you do things kind of similar. Now, do you get any? Do you ever get snow in those mountains? Um, we do get snow on on occasion, you know, and obviously it's it's an elevational thing. It's meaning, you know, there there are many times that you'll have snow, say above 3000 feet or above 4,000 feet or above 5,000. Um, but you know, the lower elevations won't have it, but typically, so my home, I live at about 2,500 feet elevation and I hunt, I'd say most of the time I'm hunting anywhere from 3000 to 5,000 feet elevation wise. What's the highest peaks down there? Um, the, they're all, you know, 6,000 plus. So, So the, let me just give a, maybe a good way to start this would be to give a general description of the region before we talk about, meaning the mountains and kind of set the framework and the backdrop for the hunting. Yeah. And that, so where I hang, the Southern Appalachian region is, is, it's fairly broad. You notice I say Southern Appalachian. If you're up North, you say Appalachian, but down here it's Appalachian. So anyways, down in the Southern Appalachians, the, it's a it's a pretty broad region that goes down into Alabama and Tennessee, but the the region I really focus on um, would be the southern part of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so the Blue Ridge Mountains start up in Virginia, in in the uh, you know Shenandoah National Park. They're kind of just a thin line there, and then they come down. And when they hit southwestern Virginia, they kind of spread out like a teardrop, and that teardrop is kind of pointing to the southwest and covers most of Western North Carolina, much of North Georgia and much of East Tennessee. And that, that teardrop again, the Southern Blue Ridge mountains, it's, it's dominated by national forests. You got the Cherokee national forest in Tennessee, the Chattahoochee national forest um, in Georgia, you got the Pisgah national forest and the Nantahala national forest in North Carolina. And there are people that live in that. I mean, it's a huge area. There are people that live in that area. But there's really only one town in the heart of it that, of any size, and that's Asheville, North Carolina. You know, that's a town of, you know, say, a couple hundred thousand people. Otherwise, it's kind of these small mountain towns that are kind of dispersed uh, throughout the region. And and 
the South, this is kind of what put us in touch, Hal, because, you know, I think you had, uh, you were answering a listener's question for something, something about the Southern Appalachians and, and, uh, you know, the, and we, you were talking about the height of the mountains down there, down here versus up in the Northeast and, and the white mountains in particular. And, you know, by far the biggest mountains east of the Mississippi are down here. So I can't remember the exact statistic, but let's just say there's approximately 30 mountain peaks east of the Mississippi that are over 6,000 feet elevation. You know, Mount Washington would be one. I think there might be another one up there, but like, let's just say 28 of them would be down here. So, I mean, very big mountains. So the way to, first of all, just picture the topography and the broad landscape, <clears throat> picture the white mountains in the Northeast, but picture them covering a much bigger area, you know, covering all the Western North Carolina, North Georgia, East Tennessee, and then northern parts of Virginia, or sorry, southwestern parts of Virginia. So pretty big area and really, really big mountains. So you got these high elevation mountains, but then you move them down south and you put them at a, a fairly low latitude. And so you end up with this, this really um, kind of unique ecosystem where it's it's almost like a temperate rainforest in a lot of it. We get you know, we get quite a bit of rain at, at certain times of the year. And we're a really the forest. I mean, obviously, when you get down and you start looking at real kind of fine scale, you get these different patches here and there, different forest types. But in general, <clears throat> you could characterize our forest as like a, a kind of a hardwood dominated forest. Um, so it's it's dominated by oaks, hickories. Historically, it would have been dominated by by chestnuts, um, but there's also incredible diversity. So there have been a number of studies that show, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, the Great Smoky Mountains, for example, has some of the greatest tree diversity of, of uh, you know, in the temperate, you know, zone around the entire planet. So really, really high diversity area, lot of topography, hardwood dominated forest, um, and, and, and again, really, really big mountains. I mean, m almost everything is straight up and down. <clears throat> so very steep. Um, and a couple of things I'll mention about the forest and how it changes. Cause as we get into talking about deer hunting, this, this kind of has a big impact on it. First of all, um, uh, is, is that because it's so hardwood dominated, it, it's a, it, it, but it's very diverse. It's very wet. It's at a low latitude. What happens is in the summer months or in the warm months when the leaves are out, the leaves are out, it, you, it's a very hard forest to see into. In most places, you can only, you know, you're only seeing 20, 30 feet because there's just kind of vegetation everywhere and leaves everywhere. So it's very difficult to see. However, <clears throat> once the leaves fall, it becomes very, very wide open. Um, and you can see in most places for a long, long ways, like some of the big, you know, hardwood stands you have in the, in the Northeast. So, so it's, it always struck me coming from new England and living in the Rockies, the, the, the seasonal change in the forest in terms of how far you can see. I mean, it goes from one extreme to being able to see almost nothing to another extreme of being able to see forever. <clears throat> so that's interesting and has obviously big implications for deer hunting. When so does that typically ahead. happen, Chris? When do your leaves drop there? Uh, um, you know, we're, we're, it, it depends, but you know, you can kind of, it's not that far behind you guys because we're at elevation. I say you guys, I'm thinking more Southern New England, but you know, we're talking, um, you know, our, our, our color starts in September. We have fabulous foliage down here because of the tree diversity. We don't have the sugar maples that, you know, parts of New England have, which give you guys that great color. But, but anyways, it, it, but October, it goes through October, you know, our peak foliage will typically be, you know, more kind of mid, but maybe a little more late October. <clears throat> so, um, we can talk about deer season, but by the time you're, when you're hunting deer in the mountains, for the most part, um, it, 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 in the effective part, let's just say, and we'll talk about that as we get to kind of some of the systems we've developed, um, there will be no leaves on the trees. You're hunting the deer in December. So 
um, late November, December, and the leaves are certainly gone by then. You know, again, they're gone in, in you know, by early November, typically. <laughs> the other really interesting piece, and this is another another thing that, that you and I started emailing about how, is rhododendron. And so <clears throat> if you go to southern New England, you will start bumping into this to this shrub that, you know, they call mountain laurel. And you've probably walked through some of it and it can be, um, you know, it can be quite a, a, a bear to get through, um, but it can also be quite amazing cover for deer. So if the further south you get, there is actually rhododendron in New England and places, but it's nothing like down here. <clears throat> rhododendron is a very significant component of, of our Southern Appalachian forest. So it's, and it can get, um, they can be these huge stands <clears throat> that that might cover a whole drainage, for example. <clears throat> and they're, you know, it's an evergreen, it's a tree, uh, or it's like a, if I call it a tree or a shrub, but it's, 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 it's basically like a shrub that can grow, you know, typically 10 to 20 feet. And, and you, again, you can have entire drainages, entire mountainsides that will be covered by this. And it is a, it varies in its density. Sometimes you can walk through it. Most of the time, it's nearly impassable. Um, it, it's just, I've been out doing field work. I've been, they call them rhododendron hells. I've been out in a rhododendron hell, and I was literally trying to get off this mountain up by the Appalachian Trail, and I was crawling through the rhododendron, and my feet were not on the ground. I was just it kind of suspended in these this jungle of branches of rhododendron it just that, kind of that sounds like fun it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's it is no joke whoever that gentleman was who wrote that email into you um he, he's serious and, and it's obvious as you can imagine it adds a serious component to you know the habitat for deer in terms of cover there's there's virtually no forage. It becomes a monoculture, and I believe there's some chemical components in the leaves that kind of, uh, you know, promote that monoculture or, or basically just having rhododendron. So it doesn't provide a food resource. Um, I mean, I, I will say the deer will browse it, but it's got to be very, very extreme, difficult um, winter for them to browse it because it's, I believe it also has some chemical compounds it can be kind of difficult for the deer to break down. So anyway, so those two components are, are really important to think about when you think about the, the landscape. Um, the other interesting thing is about the deer, but I guess maybe I should hold back. Sorry, do you guys have any questions about like about the, the region itself and the landscape and the habitat of the deer? I was wondering if you have any uh, other like conifer trees, you know, spruce or fir or pine or hemlock or any of that yes we we have well so we do have spruce and fir but those would only be at the highest elevations so you know you're talking about um you know well over five thousand feet more like over around six thousand feet so um if you go up to there's there's a spot in the smokies great smoky mountains national park you can go up newfound road and you get to um clingman's dome and or any of these high, high points, and then you can drive to some of these places, and you will see you are in a boreal forest. It looks like you are up in Maine. You've got spruce, um, fir, you know, birch trees. It's a, you know, whereas we don't have birch trees at most elevations in the mountains, for example. So we have that ecosystem type, but it's really, really high elevation. <clears throat> and then we do have white pine, we do have hemlock, although our hemlocks have, uh, you know, that you've probably heard of that hemlock woolly adelgid. I mean, this is really ground zero for those impacts. I mean, our, our hemlocks are like 90% dead, right? Now. Um, um, again, white pine. And then at lower elevations, we have some interesting pines that, that lower, like kind of more like foothill type elevations and they can get a little bit higher too, but you know, say anywhere from like a thousand feet up to 2000 feet, they may be more common, but kind of like pine trees that are more, they would be like kind of more like a Southern type pine, if you will. So, you know, things like shortleaf pine, Virginia pine, pitch pine. Um, we have a 
uh, table mountain pine is a real fire dependent <clears throat> pine tree that lives on some ridges. So, um, you know, it'd be like, there, you know, up in the Northeast, you know, say near Albany or down in Western Mass, where I grew up, there are these, or like in New Jersey, there are these sand barrens and they have, you know, these pine trees, kind of like pitch pine type trees. They're more fire, the whole ecosystem is more like fire dependent. And, and so anyways, we do have that component. But that's more dominant at the lower elevations in the mountains. So what um, about so we do have them, but they're not as they don't strike me like if I'm hiking up in the Green Mountains or, or up in Maine. When you look out into the forest, it's not as much of a component. Again, it's hardwood dominated. You know, a huge percentage of the forest would look like the hardwood ridges that you guys are used to, where you can see a long, long ways. Hey everyone, Hal here. Just wanted to take a minute to talk a minute about uh, the Woodman Arms muzzleloader. We uh, we got them all set on the website to build your own and uh, or buy your uh, Big Woods Bucks model, either one you want to do. But anyways, we've tested a lot, and it's I can honestly say it's the most accurate muzzleloader on the market, best to carry in the Big Woods or anywhere else at 5.5 pounds. You can't go wrong with it. So get on there and check it out. Hey, guys, Joe here. Wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Lake Parlin Lodge. We're a uh, four-season lodge located just south of Jackman. We've got cabins, lodge rooms, mini lodge. We're a big snowmobile destination in the winter, full restaurant, bar, all the amenities that you need for your trip. Open all, obviously, through the summer, right on the lake. Kayaks, canoes, all included with the cabin. We also do a lot of weddings, so if you're looking for a destination wedding, we can do a wedding up to 200 people. And, uh, of course... We've got our hunting season, moose season, deer season. So check us out. We're at lakeparlinlodge.com. And how uh, prevalent is woodcutting there? Is it a big industry like up here? It depends where you are. So on the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia, where I do a lot of my hunting, um, there's very little cutting because essentially the Chattahoochee National Forest has kind of become the, the playground for Atlanta which is not a bad thing. It's brought a lot of great resources to the forest and to the communities. But um, because of that, um, there is a, a more of a kind of a, a preservationist hands-off uh, approach to a lot of the forest management. So a lot of the Chattahoochee, not all of it, a lot of it is in very mature forest. Um, they have been doing more prescribed fire over the, over the last handful of years, which is great. Um, and then as you go to North Carolina, North Carolina, the, the Western North Carolina kind of is dominated almost by like a, an outdoor recreation culture, meaning like mountain biking, rock climbing, um, you know, it'd be like almost kind of like more like Vermont of the South. Um, I don't know if that's a fair comparison and I apologize to anyone I'm offending it, or not offending with that statement. I is, love Vermont and is there a I lot of North Carolina. Is there a lot of Priuses there? <laughs> Subaru. No, no, oh, no Subaru. Subaru. Subaru is Prius the, is a little extreme. Subaru is the Vermont <laughs> state vehicle. <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> but no, I'm sure there are lots. Chris of drives a Subaru, guys. <laughs> <laughs> there are also lots of full size pickups too. I'm sure. So, okay. but um, and then uh, you know, but in North Carolina, you know, there is a little more forestry. Um, and the same with Tennessee. But I will say in general, no, it's not a big business. The South um, is a huge producer of fiber. You know, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but certainly we'd probably rival what you guys are doing up there. But the, that is all coming from the deep South, meaning that's private, you know, huge timber companies owning huge tracts of land, kind of like you have in northern Maine. Um, and that's all kind of Southern pine. You know, when you go to Home Depot and, you know, or, or whatever your hardware store is and you're buying this yellow pine, this Southern pine, I mean, a lot of that's coming out of places like Georgia, Florida, Alabama. So that we're a huge timber producing region, but the, at that mountain portion of the Southeast, um, that's actually a small component. Yeah. The biggest difference down there, like I've noticed in South Georgia, it's all timberland, but it's all leased timberland. <laughs> So everything is hunting clubs down there as opposed to being like it is here where it's all open for everyone. So that was that was one of the yes. big differences I saw. 
yeah, it's a hunting lease culture, which is, I mean, imagine that if, if like all of Northern Maine, if you could not hunt any of that land, just walking onto it, if you had to go and pay a lease for a portion of that. And I don't think it'll ever get to that point up there, but that is, that's how it functions down here is, is uh, land is leased for hunting. And then it helps the landowners, you know, the lease rates typically, um, typically cover the taxes on a given property. So, but I do want to be clear, that's not the culture in the mountains where, where, where I'm talking about with the, these more, this more big woods hunting, that's more of the, the South Georgia, you know, deep South model. Uh, Is it a lot of national forest that you're hunting on? <clears throat> yeah, almost exclusively. We yeah. have a, you know, the County I live in, for example, is about 75% public land. Um, you know, I can walk out my back door to public land. I can walk out my back door to, uh, you know, to the Appalachian Trail, um, to multiple wilderness areas. So it's a, you know, it's a very wild place, you know, and there's, you know, I think our entire county has a population somewhere around like 20,000 people. The biggest town is about 2,000 people. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty small rural place. Basically, we're like a, and this whole region is kind of like this, but it's like a, it's a tourist driven economy, you know, so it's, um, there are a lot of people, you know, on a Friday afternoon, if you get on the main road coming up into the region, you know, it, it can almost be a traffic jam at certain times of the year, but then you just get off that road and you're in the middle of nowhere. Cause all those people are going to a particular place. They're going to the national park or they're going somewhere. So tourist driven economy. I always viewed it, uh, kind of like what we are to the Massachusetts, Connecticut, crowd is what North Carolina, at least anyway, the Asheville and the mountainous area up there is to, you know, Florida and, and, uh, Atlanta, the big population bases where they, everyone has their second home or their camp, or whatever you want to call it. And they, they hit it on the weekends. You're exactly right. So, you know, if you're, if you're cruising around and, and cringing at a New Jersey plate, I'm cringing at a Florida plate somewhere. I know you don't cringe on them, Joe, because I know you depend on that business. So <laughs> yeah. um, you probably welcome them. But um, but yes, it is it's the same exact same thing. We are the we are kind of the first place you can hit mountains and cool summer weather. Um, so a lot of people come up here in the summer. A lot of people have second homes here. They'll actually split their time, say between mountains of Georgia and South Georgia or Western North Carolina and Florida. It's, it's probably very similar to where you guys are. Are there hunting camps there similar to what we have here where people have old, <laughs> old hunting camps that have been there for a hundred years and that sort of thing? No, I would say it's not, um, it's not the culture in the mountains. At least there isn't that hunting camp culture. Like, you know, like I had grown up in new England and I'm sure you guys have had it. It's different, and in particular in the mountains here, um, you know, so there is kind of this, you know, they are usually associated with leases or, or owning the land. But in South Georgia, there is a kind of this southern hunting camp culture. And I should say I do have a cabin um, on thousands of acres in South Georgia and, and, and uh, you know, it is a hunting cabin. And I have that part of what I do, too. But, but I really love the, the big woods piece of hunting. So up here in the mountains, the other thing I'd say is it's not famous for deer hunting. It's an over, it's a, it's a, it's just not a destination type place. It's so similar to, to, to Maine, you know, and then I don't say, you know, maybe somebody in New Hampshire is really fired up to, to get out and go hunt a big buck in Maine, but your average guy in Illinois, is not like, yeah, I need to go to Maine to hunt deer. And they're in the same way. They're not like, yeah, I want to go to Western North Carolina and hunt deer. Well, we're famous or, or more of a destination for, from a sporting perspective, um, is that we have really good trout fishing. I mean, it, it's, you know, I've done a lot of trout fishing out West when I lived in uh, Idaho. Um, and, and, you know, the trout fishing here is, is, you know, stacks up. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. And then bear hunting, we have, um, you know, all this public land that I was talking about and we have really high density bear populations, um, and I would say there's a culture around the trout fishing that de has developed over long periods of time. And you do see kind of these, I don't know if you might call them like a trout camp, but you know, somebody, a number of cabins, older cabins that are kind of set up on the trout creeks. Um, and then the bear hunting culture is strong and deep. Uh, it's a, it's a dog hunting 
culture. Um, kid I went to high school with, who you guys might know, a guy named Mark Dufresne lives up there. He's a taxidermist. And, yeah, I, uh, I know Mark, yeah. So we went to the same high school. He was a year older than me, maybe two years. Anyways, um, he comes down here, you know, and, and hangs out with these old plot hound guys in Tennessee. And, um, but anyway, so there's a real culture uh, around bear hunting, around running dogs. Um, that Those are kind of the, the cultures that, the hunting and fishing cultures that, that are strongest here in the Southern Appalachian region. But so the deer hunting, there are, there's a, there's a, there's a good group of kind of local folks who, who do hunt deer and, um, and know how to hunt them, uh, here. Cause it's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, you, you know, I've heard you guys talk on the podcast before about hunting deer in the South or the Midwest, you know, you kind of go out and sit and, you know, there's high densities of deer. I, we have that in South Georgia and I have that, you know, on this property I was telling you about with my hunting cabin there. But, uh, but in general up here, I mean, this is for deer. It's some of the most difficult hunting, um, that I've ever done or anything. I mean, it's very difficult. So uh, yeah. it, it doesn't sit down in a tree and, and, you know, deer just start filing into a, into a field. I mean, it's nothing. It is nothing to hunt for two weeks and not see a single deer. So, so you have to be very strategic, you know, hunting, you know, there's always a luck component, right? But you can, you can position yourself to increase your chances of being lucky. So you have to be strategic because, you know, your chances are so low of being lucky here. You have to be strategic to just kind of maximize those chances. And even at that, it's still very tough. <laughs> I've been taking this all in, so it it actually sounds like it's very very similar to hunting up here in that respect. That seems like the deer are drawn to the agriculture; they they flourish more. But in the big woods, even down there, there's a lot less deer, and consequently, you have a lot less hunters that hunt for them because it's more difficult. You know, a lot of people like the easy way, and they would rather hunt where there's a lot of deer, but so it sounds very similar in that way. So um, tell us about how, how you do hunt there. Because I think by, by what you were saying is because the deer are few. What, what I always tell people is, you know, those bucks in particular, you know, they're only using about 10% of the territory they cover. You know, there's corridors they go through and stuff. So you're only really, they're only using that 10%. And, uh, so that's where you need to focus, you know, on the 10%. And it sounds like it's very similar there, huh? Yeah, very much so. And, and, you know, I come up to New England, um, each year and, and, um, and I do, you know, one of my favorite types of hunting is, is, you know, tracking deer. So I try to come up every year and I can't do it like you guys do, but I try to come up for, you know, a four to six day stretch each year. So I, I have a lot of experience, um, hunting that that style that you guys do and i would say that while the technique's very different because we don't have snow that the the technical nature of it and how how difficult it can be because of the real low deer numbers just like you said how the fact that you have this this enormous wild landscape and the deer are using very particular small percentage of it and you have to figure that out but then again you don't have snow here most of the time to help you figure that out so um what me and my friends i have you know I have a few friends who hunt pretty hard one in particular over the years now i've lived here about 10 years we've kind of come up with a strategy and this strategy now allows us you know i i, I have at least one opportunity, sometimes two opportunities, meaning I have this deer standing in front of me. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, that, that I end up with it in my freezer, but, um, you know, I can get one or two opportunities on our target buck, uh, in a given year using this, this technique and this technique, it's nothing groundbreaking and there are different components that different people use in different areas, but it was just something that we've figured out, um, that, that has worked for us. And the first thing I'll tell you is that, um, our target, you know, while up there, you know, I've heard you guys on the podcast joking a lot about 200 pound deer versus 198 pound deer, you know? So, um, it's not a weight thing. You know, our deer simply don't get that big. Um, there's an occasional 200 pound deer shot in Georgia, but it's very rare. 
Um, weighing deer is not part of the culture. Um, very few deer, unless they're shot on like a state wildlife management area, um, very few deer would be weighed. So, um, and, then, and when they and when they are, I'm sorry, Chris, but when they are, they're usually the guts in, correct? I'm sorry, I missed that. When, when they actually do ha- take a big deer and they end up weighing it, it's usually with the guts in, isn't it, before it's field dressed? Um, you know, I, th- I think it depends, uh, to be honest with you, I don't usually hunt those wildlife management areas. It's very rare. So I don't have a lot of experience with that. Yep. I do have a buddy who does quite a bit and I know he guts his before, um, okay. it gets weighed, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I guess I can't answer that there, if there's a, you know, kind of one way that most people do it. Um, but up here in the mountains, um, you know, weighing the deer would be a very, um, a rare thing we are georgia is known as a, one of the top whitetail hunting states in the country um uh you know we're not quite the midwest in terms of antler size but um you 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 know you have the potential to to harvest a really large deer um antler wise you know i think our, our state record which is i should say was actually shot about 10 miles from this cabin uh, that i've been talking about that i have in south georgia our state record scored, I believe, like in the 268 ballpark. Um, and uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's very multiple, you know, 150 to 200 inch deer shot each year in Georgia. What, so what town, are, what town are you in down there? Town do I live in or what town where, where is where your the cabin, cabin is. in? Yeah. It, it's in Telfair County. Okay. Yeah. Was it Billy Joe Paget's buck that you're talking about? It was. Yes, sir. He's still alive. So <laughs> Yeah, I know. I actually know him. Oh, there you go. He goes, you can go see that buck. It's hanging in the supper club down there. So Yeah. Yeah. He's uh <laughs> my my family down there is in Douglas, so his his uh he goes to their church, so I know him through there. But anyway. Oh uh, really? So that was a mon- that-, that was a monster buck. Big non typical. Oh, yeah. Huge. I- and you can you know, um Handbeck there, if you go to his webpage, he has some good pictures of it if you want to show those guys after we get off the phone here. Yep. But anyways, yeah, so you're in Douglas. That's that's we're just north of you. So, um, you know, if you go north and cross the Okmulgee River and go just a little bit east, that's where the cabin is. Yeah, but, I, uh, I didn't. I didn't realize Joe was such a southern boy. Oh, I've got a lot of, <laughs> lot of roots down there. <laughs> if you ever eat at Bobby's Treat Shop in Douglas, that's my family. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I haven't been there, but I will. You got to try it. <laughs> yep. Tell them you want a free meal on Joe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they'll probably throw you out. Yeah, they probably will. They'll probably say, Joe, who? <laughs> I used to hunt in uh, Ellaville. Is that anywhere near what you guys are talking about? Do you know where Ellaville is? No, in Georgia. No. Ellaville or Ella J? No, Ellaville. Ellaville. I don't yeah, know where that it's, is. It's just over the Georgia, uh, excuse me, Florida line there. It's, it's you know, southern Georgia there. The deer hunting, uh, okay. was, deer hunting was awesome. It was all Plum Creek land, actually. Seem, seemed yeah, weird. they I, do have a lot down there. Yeah, I'd go from Maine and Plum Creek to Georgia to Plum Creek land. But, yeah, yeah it was a lot of deer. A lot of deer. It was yeah. good, good hunting. So, uh, Chris, anyways, you was talking about, um, you know, you don't get snow that often. So, you you know, you got a, you got some other yep. strategies. But a lot of people get the idea that we, when we talk a lot, we, we like to track. So, we're talking about snow a lot. But, quite frankly... We don't have snow all that often here either. I mean, it's yeah. weekend. Last year we had it was like the year of the snow, but I've seen seasons up here, up north, where we never really got any snow to speak of for the whole deer season. You know, you might get an inch or two and it melts off. So I just didn't want people to think that that's all we do is hunt in the snow because we've had to figure out over the years how to hunt without snow too. Yeah. Yeah, no, it seems like it's more and more frequent to have, have less and less snow up there. So um, it's uh, – remind me, you know, before we get off the phone, if we have time, I, I should go through the story of that that buck that I sent you the picture of last year's buck because I did end up snow tracking him down here. But, well, that's, but what anyways, we're, that's what we're waiting on. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me kind of just give a, a, a fairly quick overview of, of the, the strategy that we use. And, and I don't want to, there's, there may be some other hunters out there listening who hunt this region and they may have other strategies that are, are successful. But again, um, this has allowed us to have at least one opportunity. Oh, at a, at a mature buck. That's what I was talking about is what we're targeting. So 
we're, we're not necessarily targeting antlers up here. Our antlers don't get as big as South Georgia necessarily. You know, the county record was just set last year, and that was like 170 inch deer. Um, but but typically, you know, a 130 inch rack up here in the southern Appalachian Mountains would be a very, very nice deer. So typically what our what our benchmark is, what we're hunting for is what we call mature deer. I know the deer mature at a younger age than than this, but typically we're 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 searching for deer that are a minimum of three and a half years old. Um, but but you know, going uh, anywhere up from there. And similar to up there, you know, you can you can get into very old deer because it is such a wild landscape. You can just have deer that have just survived kind of in the middle of nowhere for years and years. So the way we do that starts kind of in the summer, um, mid to late summer. And um, deer and turkeys and bears and all of these forest animals down here are so, their, their annual cycles, their habitat use throughout the year is so dominated by acorns. Because, again, it's a hardwood dominated forest. Um, by far, I mean, you, you look out into the forest and it's just, you know, oh, there's a red oak, there's two white oaks, there's a hickory, there's another red oak. It's just nonstop mass producing trees. And so these trees produce, um, you, you know, the primary food for the deer and everything. And how how the, the mast production is um, and how that varies um, over space um, and time, you know, year to year, or, you know, some years, for example, we have really good acorns down low, you know, below 2000 feet, but everything above 2000 feet is pretty poor. And so the, the first step is to determine what the, the mast pattern is. Again, is it an elevational thing? Are there a lot of acorns everywhere? Or is it only hickories that are really producing that year so on and so forth and so that that gives you some base knowledge on where food is going to be and how it's going to be distributed and that's going to have a significant impact on hunting the bucks that, that we're targeting come you know that fall and um the again these are these very vast landscapes so as we get into um we get into the deer season. There's one thing I need to tell you about, and that's the rut here. So I've lived here 10 years. I spend, I hunt, I'm on day 40 today. After this call, I'll be out in the turkey woods. I hunt 40 to 50 days a year for turkey. I hunt, you know, 50 plus days a year for deer. I spend, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 days in the woods up here looking for rattlesnakes as part of my work. My point is I spent a lot of time in the woods here. I have only ever seen a buck one time outside of the rut, ever. Hunting, hiking, ever. Oh, one wow. time. So that, that could get discouraging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm it's very hard. You know, and I'm sure you guys see a lot of your bucks come winter when they're, you know, down in the yards and all that. You know, we don't have that. They're they're still spread out. Deer just aren't frequently out in fields. You know, when you're in the woods, they're just they're so low density. You know, they they travel these huge distances that just you just don't see them. And so um, I always thought that's an interesting stat. And so the other important part here is that we are primarily hunting them during the rut. I hunt them at other times, but but there's uh, it's, it's almost pointless. I've never seen a buck hunting outside of the rut here. And there may be other people um, that have strategies that allow them to harvest those deer. Um, but uh, but it, I just have not been able to do that. It's um, It's very difficult. So, and when does your rut fall typically? I will, so that's what I was getting at. So if you come into the south, you know, our deer were almost extinct and they were reintroduced. And so you, you go to states like Alabama and Georgia and you have these very interesting patterns. You should Google it. Google rut map Georgia and it'll show you a map of Georgia and all these different zones. And Georgia's set up because of these reintroduced deer. You can, you can hunt the rut from the beginning of our season, which starts in September, and then you can be hunting rut and deer into January when it ends. If you start on the coast where they have a September, October rut, 
Um, and then you can kind of work your way through middle Georgia where there's all these nuances between October and November when the rut is. But the mountains here, because our deer came from Texas uh, primarily, um, they were reintroduced from Texas deer. So our deer rut in, you know, if I had to pick a week, if I could only hunt one week, it would be the first week of December. So, but, but I mean, obviously throughout late November, and throughout the month of December, that's our that's our primary window for for harvesting one of these mature bucks. So I've already talked about determining how the acorn and the mast uh, production uh, is is varies in space and time. And then what we do is, as kind of also through hunting, you know, but it's kind of like hunting and scouting. Um, is is as you get into the mid and, and late fall, so as you get into like November, we put a lot of miles on our boots. Um, and we're hiking, you know, we're, we're, you know, I might have a gun with me or a bow depending on the season, but I'm not concerned about seeing a deer. You know, I'm hunting down deer sign. And in particular, you know, you see rubs here and there. But if you hike these southern Appalachian regions, <clears throat> you will find this probably very similar up there. You will find these, you know, what I call a pocket of deer sign. Um, you will find a place where, you know, you can start counting 50, 60, 70 rubs in, in a relatively small area, you know, hundreds of yards square and, and one ridge that goes out this way. And so what we do is in mid to late fall, you know, I don't concern myself. If I see one little rub that's kind of randomly out in the woods, this is too vast a landscape to, to concern myself to sit on that one rub. We hunt these pockets and, and they're not everywhere. I mean, you know, I, I have, you know, it, it, it can take miles and days of hiking to find these pockets. But then when we find that pocket for that year, the deer are starting to lay down that sign. Um, oftentimes, first thing I'll say is that these can be miles, you know, from the road back in the mountains. Like think, think of the White Mountains again, big mountains like that. And, you know, you're parking and, and you're hiking into these. So we find these pockets and then the way we hunt them is that we hike in in the dark um, and we hike to these pockets you know we obviously figure out how to how to you know how we want to hunt them the, the best angle um, there are certain places the deer are more likely to travel um, in these high mountains in terms of their kind of positioning on the ridges um, so we go in we set up on these pockets and we do all day sits i'll typically get in before the sun comes up and I'll sit nonstop all day during the rut again. That's an non-stop. oxymoron, huh? Sit nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> sit nonstop. <laughs> yeah, I tell, you, I tell you, it's harder than the hike, the, the mental battle that you play. Um, and sit till dark. And sometimes you do that for weeks. And um, if you do that and you're sitting in these pockets of high uh, deer activity, you know, again, we have the opportunity, um, you know, to, to typically harvest one of these big bucks. There's some interesting nuances to the technique that, that is maybe different than, not maybe, are different than up there, you know. So up there, you know, you guys have talked a lot about clothing, and, and I do the same thing. You want to be relatively lightweight. You don't want to sweat too much. But, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, a certain types of gear, you know. So in, in, in doing these remote pocket hunts um you know you've got kind of this interesting situation where you potentially have to hike miles in in pretty significant mountainous country and then you have to get to a place in december and it gets cold in december here you know it's you know might be 20 degree high maybe lower might be raining and 30 degrees so it can be pretty cold so then you arrive and you need to sit for 12 hours in that. And so um, it's kind of the Al's favorite way to hunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you get your, you get, you get your exercise in, in the beginning. Cause like I said, I mean, a lot of these are very remote, but, but you do, you sit for 12 hours and I can't tell you the, the, the psychology, the, the, the mental battle that you go through sitting there. You typically don't have cell phone service. So you're not out fiddling with your phone. You are sitting there and looking at the woods 
for 12 hours. But the key here is that you have done all of your work, and I, I grossly oversimplified it um, for the sake of time, so I know we're getting on here, but you know, you've done all your work in terms of learning the mast production and how that varies again in space and time, and you've done all your work then using those data, meaning the mass data, to inform where you go look for these pockets. And then when you find these pockets, um, you know, you've done all that upfront work um, and then you know where to go and you just keep going there. And um, how are you? Getting your, how do you get your deer out? Um, I, you know, from back from my Western days, and I, sh- I should say I still hunt out West every year. I'm, I'm a big, uh, you know, I love, I love hunting Western big game and birds and anything out there. So, uh, but um, I always use the gutless method. You know, it's not as important down here to, uh, to weigh our deer. So there's no, you know, there's no benefit to using all that energy to drag out a deer for miles through serious mountain country. Um, so I, you know, I use the gutless method. It's what I used out West. I can get every piece of meat off a deer and never gut it. And, um, and, you know, and, you know, so you pack and, them all out, basically. You bring a pack frame back in. And, and, back, and back, back them out, yeah. correct. Yeah, Chris, I get, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you now, when, when you find the spots, you know, your pockets, and, and we call them the same thing, right, How We, we call yeah. them, we oh, find yeah. our pockets, and we and we spend a lot of time there. But do you see a lot of other deer, too? I mean, it's not like you sit there uh, and only see the buck you want to shoot. You see a lot of other deer, smaller bucks? So how's that go? Rarely. There, there are very few deer here. You're, you're as likely to see a bear, and and bear season's actually open at the same time, so you you shoot a bear if, if it comes through. Uh, but no, I mean, it depends. You know, you could. It would not surprise me to hunt for a week, or especially before the rut. I will say, when the rut comes on, you see deer, but again, you might hunt four days. And at one point during those four days, you have a group of two does go by. That would not, that would be very normal. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, but then there are time periods, like say in October, where, you know, you might hunt for two weeks and not see a single deer. And again, you're not hunting that, those pockets of sign yet. So you, you're not able to increase your chances of being lucky um, yet by, by, you know, as much. So, uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, you know, when I hunt South Georgia, yeah, it's, it's, an, I had this statistic where if I didn't see 13 deer in a morning or an afternoon sit, so we're talking two or three hours, then it wasn't a good hunt. Right. You know? right. Yeah, I remember the but first... up here, you know, I, you can hunt for a week and not see a deer and that is not, um, surprising at all right well, first time i had in southern georgia i saw eight bucks before i shot mine the, the guys yeah. are like the guys <laughs> yeah they're going mike wait wait i'm going are you kidding me i just said four <laughs> <laughs> there's a buck right there what are you talking about <laughs> but you know i mean you talk about not seeing a buck you know until the rut i mean we have that pretty much here too we don't we don't see our big bucks until the rut comes you just don't ride the rounds and see them same thing with that big bull moose you don't. You think they never existed? Then all of a sudden the rut comes and they're everywhere, huh? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of people up here that hunt that way too. That have found they find their place and they're content to just to go sit and spend their week there. And and uh, but lots of people like to hunt that way. But well, yeah, not me. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I prefer to be you know quite you know honest with you. I mean, my favorite white. I like hunting whitetails anywhere where you have big wild country. I mean, I go anywhere, big swamps, whatever it might be, but yeah, but no, my favorite hunting for sure is, is, is hunting, you know, deer on snow up North. That's my favorite. So, yep. um, I got the one, other part, I, hang oh, go on ahead. one second. Sorry, I just got another question. You talk about finding these rubs. Do you, you must have signpost rubs there. Hey, Hal here. Just want to take a minute to talk about the hunting club and, uh, You can join by going right online at uh, bigwoodsbucks.com. But anyways, I've got uh, all my information is going in there, and it's a place where you can get together and and, uh, look at my films, tips, writings, and all of that. And the best part is is, is, is forums for you to communicate with, you know, the rest of the club members, talk about Big Wood stuff and all of that. So anyways, 36 bucks a year. Cheap and getting a Starbucks once a day. So 
join up and hope you see her on there. Yeah, but they're not as um, they're not as common, and not to say that they're common up there either. But I see them more commonly in the Northeast. Um, you know, like on ash trees or or whatever it might be. But then down in um, in South Georgia and the big swamps, I have a lot of big swamps down there, and, and I see them a little bit more, maybe at the same frequency I see them up north. I don't see them as much here, but I certainly do see them. Um, they're typically on, you know, I've seen them on hemlocks. I've seen them on, you know, we have a, if you're at kind of a little bit lower elevations, you might get some cedars. The red, um, the red cedar, they like hemlock, red cedar, and, and white oak is what I found down south of here is they rub the most, the signpost. Yeah, and I see a lot of rubs on, um, you know, on oaks, but not not that I'd say signpost necessarily on white oaks. That is, um, I've seen a couple on poplars, and that we have um, tulip poplars down here. They're called. They're a little different than the aspen you have up there. I've seen a couple on those, um, and obviously, if you find one, uh, that that's a good, um, you know, that, that's a good place to mark. But again, it, it the our their food changes so year to year i mean and you could say that about anywhere but but um but their food chain like you might have a situation where say they had a pocket they had you know so you're finding you'd find signpost rubs and and lots of sign and all of this in a particular pocket however next year the food resource changed and it's not just that everything's gone up or everything has gone down so they're going to kind of use the same areas it's that if they go up a thousand feet in elevation, they've got, you know, the highest protein food they can find in that forest. So they abandon that pocket that year. That's why, and that's what makes it a little different than a lot of regions is it's so dominated by mast, by acorns that you have to find them every single year. Don't get me wrong. These pockets will be used. You know, if you find a pocket, you always remember that and you go back there and check it you know that's that's an important part when you're doing this scouting to find the pockets in a given year you visit your old places especially if they're in an acorn zone from that year you know for that given condition that year because you know they will certainly get used over and over but you might have a year where the mass production is different and the deer just aren't right there that year it just would not be productive you know for them for whatever reason whether it's the does and so but, you know, it, it's, it, it varies quite a bit. So it's, it's almost, again, it's this annual, it's not learning the deer once. And then you've got some pattern where, oh, they bed here and they feed here. And, and then they, you know, the, the bucks, you know, they're rutting and this is the route they make, you know, that can change year to year because everything's so dominated by acorn mass. The other thing I would say, um, another good strategy is that once deer season ends, um, you know, we get out the, the squirrel gun and, um, you know, in January and February, uh, we hike these forests because the, the buck sign will still be there. So even after we're done hunting, you know, we spend a lot of time looking for these pockets. So we just, you know, I'll go squirrel hunting and the goal is to just cover miles and, and looking for these. And then we just file them away. And so we go, oh, there's a pocket. And, you know, again, they might not be used every year, but, but it's a place to come check because they, you know, it's, it's certainly in the route of, of bucks and a place that you have a higher chance of, of finding one in a given year. So, so you don't, in the winter, you don't have snow that stays on the ground all winter. Then you might, it more probably comes and goes. Yeah. If it snows, it typically, you know, it, it probably snows at my house again at 2,500 feet. Let's just say it probably snows like three or four times a year. Um, and let's say three of those four would be like an inch or two inches and it will melt by the next day. We might get one snowstorm that's, let's say six inches and it melts over three days, but it's, it's pretty, pretty mild winter. But like I said, uh, you know, this, I did have the opportunity to, uh, to snow track, uh, this, that buck that I showed you, uh, or sent you the picture of, uh, last year. So we had, we had a pretty good snow year during the deer season. The other thing I would say is that our deer season ends in mid-January and the majority of snow that we get 
would be in January and February. So usually the snow misses the deer season, you know, the December in December, we, we typically don't get snow, but you know, this past year we did. Yeah. What, let's hear about that buck. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a quite a story and it's, it's quite a tracking story actually. But, um, uh, and after the fact, after I shot him tracking story, but, um, you know, so, uh, this is a, uh, this is an area actually pretty close to my house, right on the Georgia, North Carolina line in the, um, in the Nantahala mountains. Um, and I had found one of these, you know, I'd done my, done my homework, like we talked about with the, with the mast, I'd, I'd done my homework in terms of identifying, uh, this particular pocket and I was hunting, uh, this deer and, and I encountered him three times. The, the first time was the very beginning, you know, early in the rut. And I was, uh, I was on a little ridge and I was sitting, I, I typically, um, how I sit in the woods is I, they make these like tree slings, these little like hammocks that kind of like attach to a tree. And then there's a post that goes down and you kind of like sit in this little hammock. So anyways, I'm, I'm sitting up on this ridge and all the, and it's a real cold, crisp morning. And, and these leaves are like potato chips and on the far ridge across from me, I hear this ruckus, you know, and all of a sudden I see this doe, you know, and they're, 200 yards away, maybe two to to say 300 yards away. And this doe comes running across the high ridge. And, um, and then this, uh, this smaller buck, I don't want to say smaller. It was an eight point, but this eight points runs chasing her up the ridge. And then, you know, a minute later, all of a sudden I hear another deer coming and it was that buck. And, uh, and he's, he's certainly the King. He's certainly the, 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 the dominant buck in that that pocket area that i was hunting i knew right when i saw him and uh he, ch- he was chasing her and him up and they got up on this ridge top up in those rhododendrons and i could hear him running around in there um grunting a little bit and then about half an hour later they come out and they're going back down the same trail and and i was trying to grunt him i don't like to take long shots you know I, i'll typically most deer i shoot are under 100 yards I mean, I might shoot 100, 150 yard deer, um, but uh, but anyways, I wasn't going to take a 300 yard shot. There was no way, um, and so I let him go away. So then, anyways, then I go off to Vermont, and I was I did uh, it was a great snow year last year. It was actually too much snow, but I was hunting uh, the Green Mountains, uh, southern part of the Green Mountains, kind of about uh, east of Bennington. And anyway, so I do that for for a week and had a real nice week. I, uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm a good buck every day and actually shot and, uh, shot at a buck and wounded a tree. And, uh, so anyways, I had a good week up there and so I was real fired up, came back to Georgia, real fired up about the, the, uh, you know, the, the tracking and I get back and there's snow in Georgia. And so I go, um, uh, it, it, I go out, it, it's actually just about melted, but I, but I go out, I've probably got two days left of snow at the rate it's melting. And, um, I, I get up into this pocket and, uh, and I cut this buck's track. Once I get into that area, almost immediately, it was raining at the same time. Uh, it, but the, and so the snow was the, the tracks were really, I call it washed out. And, uh, you know, I'm probably not nowhere near as good at, reading a track as, as you guys are because i don't do it as much and um and so I, I thought this buck was quite a ways ahead of me but i started on it and i went i didn't go a quarter mile and all of a sudden here i look up and this buck this the same buck that i ended up harvesting is standing broadside 30 yards in front of me i throw up my gun and uh how's gonna give me trouble right here i've got a cover over my scope <laughs> <laughs> because it's raining. And, and the backstory on that without going into detail is that I had missed, not, not shot and missed, but I had missed the opportunity at, th- at two of what would have been my larger whitetails ever earlier that year because I was hunting them in the rain and I had issues with my scope. 
it, it rained. We're working all on years. something to fix that for you, Chris. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so, so anyway, so I was like, it was raining and I was like, I'm going to put my scope cover on. I never do that. It's the first time and the last time that I ever do that. And so I've got this scope cover on and I throw up my gun. He's standing there broadside and I'm like, ah, oh. pull the gun down, rip the scope cover off. And by the time I get the gun back up, the deer's off over the mountain. And so anyways, I go home. You know, I'm distraught. You know, I, I collapse in my office chair because, again, I had missed these two giant deer, not not shot them, missed opportunities at these two giant deer earlier in the season. And then I hit, you know, missed a very large deer in Vermont by hitting this tree. And so and now I was like, that was my opportunity. It's getting into December now, you know, and, and it just I just blew it. And uh, I was just distraught. Mm-hmm. My, my wife didn't, she did, didn't know what to do with me, but anyways, so, uh, so the, I go out the next day and I find his track again. He's come back into the pocket and this is the last day I'm going to have snow. It's going to melt. It's raining again. It's going to be gone. There's like, you know, it's barely, there's barely any, I get on his track and I follow him. And I can see that he's leaving this pocket area that, that was about at 3,000 feet elevation. And he's heading up into the high country. He's heading up into a wilderness area. I could just see his track going up. I followed him for a while. and, um, and But I had, to leave. I had a work engagement that afternoon. I had to leave. So I came out, went to work. The next day, I go in. I'd seen his track going into the up into this high country. You know, we're talking like high threes, 4,000 feet. In fact, in this wilderness area, I'm like, I'm not going to sit on this pocket today. The ground's wet. I'm going to walk. I'm going to go, and I'm going to go up into this wilderness area and just see if I can get lucky. So I'm walking. I get up on this high ridge. I'm, you know, as soon as I get on the highest ridge and I start walking, I walk no more than like 50 yards. And all of a sudden, I realize he's walking. He's like 40 yards away from me just below me, just off the ridge a little bit, walking towards me and doesn't see me. So I get my gun up. There's no scope cover on it. And, uh, and I, and I, you know, I stop him man, and doesn't hear me. Okay. Do it a little bit louder, man stops. He looks right at me. This deer is 30 yards from me again, giant rack for our region. And he's got a tree perfectly covering his vitals and i've got my scope on him i'm gonna do one of three things i'm gonna shoot him in the neck i'm gonna blow out his pelvis or there's just a little piece of brisket showing in the front i'm gonna try to clip a lung so i decide i'm going for the lung and i i I put the scope on him boom i shoot and uh and he bucks and he runs and i go over to him and as I'm sure you've all seen before, I mean, there is a pile of blood. You know, I shoot a, um, I'm kind of like one of your team members there, Lee. I shoot these Marlin lever actions. This is my gun of choice. And I shoot the 450. And at 30 yards, I mean, you know, I blew a hole clear through this deer. And, uh, but again, I was shooting at its brisket, hoping to catch a lung. But there's blood everywhere. I can see its lung blood, and I start following this deer. And, and it's the type of blood where you're expecting to find the deer in 100 yards, 200 yards maybe. So I go 100 yards, and there's blood, you know, every few feet. I mean, a pile of blood. I'm like, this deer is going to be bled out in 200 yards. I start following him. Just still bleeding like that. Nothing. He's gone down now. I was at the top of this ridge, and he went down the ridge. And these are big ridges. You know, we're talking about losing 800 to 1,000 feet. So he's going down this ridge and I keep following him. The blood trail never lets up. And and now I'm getting to the point when I get to the bottom of this valley, I'm I'm in disbelief. I'm like, does this deer even have blood? Okay. So then the deer starts to go up the next ridge. And and so I'm thinking, yeah, this okay, this is good. He's not gonna be able to go far uphill like this. He goes up, he crests that ridge starts you know and again these are significant ridges these aren't little knobs these are big mountain ridges like again like in the white mountains going down going up, going down. and so he goes over the next ridge 
comes down. He's he's not bleeding as heavy now, but he's still bleeding consistently. It's lung blood. I've seen a couple little chunks of lung. Um, <clears throat> goes down this next ridge, and then and he's and, and these ridges are kind of descending in elevation. So he's kind of he's going up and down, but he's kind of overall losing elevation, if that makes sense. Um, goes down into another valley and then starts up the other side. And I'm following. I ended up jumping him uh, off that third ridge. He was in the rhododendron thicket, and uh, I heard him. I was about 40 yards from him, and all of a sudden I heard him get up and run up to the top of the ridge. So I go up to his bed. Bed's just covered in blood. And, um, he, and he's bleeding still going up this third ridge, but it's not real significant. He gets to the top, and, uh, and the funny thing is now he's down in his pocket. He actually... He ran at the same trail that I had snow tracked him on two days earlier. He ran down that same trail. And so, I, you know, on the, on this third ridge, you know, he went through that trail. And so he goes up over this third ridge and he, he's coming down. Now he's come all the way down. He's come out of the wild country. He's been, he's out of the wilderness area. He, he's heading towards a paved road. You know, we're talking, it took me, I believe, six hours to recover that deer and um and and you know i don't know how many miles but the deer went miles and so i'm on the top of this ridge he starts down the other side he's not bleeding anymore but because he's going downhill in those leaves he's very easy to track i mean I, I'm, I'm flying through the woods i'm just ba- bombing down this this steep ridge following this deer and i get to the bottom and we come to a paved road Again, this is probably four hours. You know, I've said this quickly, but it's probably four hours into this track now. And uh, I come to this paved road, and he turns and starts. He's about 50 yards from the paved road, and he starts walking parallel to it. And now there's only a blood drop every 20 yards, and it's and it's getting worse. And gets to the point where, I mean, I've almost lost him multiple times. And, uh, and, you know, I, I'm down on my hands and knees looking for him. Cause again, he's not going downhill. now. I can't see the track. Long story short, I finally figure out where he crosses this road. I, I call it a paved road, but it's, it's, it is paved, but it, I mean, it's, it's a middle of nowhere road, but he crosses this road and there's um, a kind of a major Creek river, I would call it in this valley bottom. And it goes into the riparian swamp along this along this creek and um he had he'd started bleeding again when he jumped down onto the road so i was following him pretty good for a little while and then i lost him in this riparian swamp because he he wasn't doing any he wasn't doing straight line movement anymore. he was kind of like zigzagging through it uh, i mean i was on my hands and knees looking looking i had finally just given up i stood up i was after i told you about my whole season it was my toughest season in a lot of ways, you know, just mentally dealing with all those near misses. And, uh, and I could hear this Creek just raging or river again, you know, I'm 40 yards from this river. And I said, I'm just going to take a walk over to that river, make sure he didn't go to water. And I walk over, I step about two yards in that river and I look down the river and he's laying in the river piled up dead. And, uh, anyway, so I went down there, promptly pulled a howl, fell in the river, soaked myself, and then uh, and then dragged the deer out. And that's where that picture came from. The the, the deer is, uh, you know, it's right on the side of that river after I recovered it. But again, you know, we're talking five, six hours of tracking, just emotional roller coaster, losing them multiple times. Um, and what had happened is I had hit them in the brisket and I had only clipped one lung and it came out the other side. Like I said, it blew a hole through them. And I'm just lucky because because it was that brisket both of those holes were oriented towards the ground so they were he would never have bled that much and left me that much of a trail so anyways that's the story on that deer and i know i'm probably taking too much of your all's time what did that rack score or did you score it a green scored it around 135 it might be bigger you know or smaller than that um i'm not sure but for here that's that's a very 
that's a very big rack. That's a and nice you, buck you know, anywhere. Yeah, congratulations yeah. on that, <clears throat> and congratulations yeah. on the awesome tracking job and having the drive to do that. That that's what divides uh, the men from the boys a lot of times. You know, that was awesome, Chris. Yeah, thank you. I, I there was no way I was letting that that deer go. I mean, it was. I just uh, I, I was so emotionally distraught from that season. I was not let. I was going to find that deer no matter what. <laughs> so it all worked out, and uh, it turned out to be a real real good season. Uh, because of that and uh yeah you know what the moral of the story is shoot him What's in the that? ass next time i was gonna say that i was gonna say the neck <laughs> when you when you were telling that story chris i'm, I'm sitting here going well, sounds like pretty good target to me <laughs> i'm one of those guys i'll get one in them and i'll just <laughs> let it take over <laughs> yeah Chris, you strike me to be kind of the analytical type, so I think that's where what was happening there. You was trying to figure out your best option out of three, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. I. I mean, it all happened in a second, but it had. But that happened. You're right, Hal. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Oh, uh, good story. Well, we got we're about out of time here, so uh, we'll wrap things up. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to mention real quick, but we appreciate having you on and. And learning a little bit about hunting down there. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was interesting hearing about. It. Obviously, it's not the type of deep south hunting I've I've ever seen, but it it, it does sound appealing. Just the big woods there. Yeah, I think yeah. that's, and I think it's kind of coming to me now that because, like I said, I when I wrote my first book about it, it was mainly about hunting up here and in, in Maine and stuff. And by talking to people, uh, you know, over the years, I know there is plenty of big woods places you know all over the country and probably that is the common denominator is you know fewer deer harder conditions and less people hunt you know yeah because and, you of know i just things. yeah i just say you know first i i appreciate you guys um having me on you know i've listened to all the podcasts and uh you know i have a lot of respect for for what you guys are doing trying to trying to educate people and provide uh information and that, that people can take and and use and and uh yeah uh, you know as i told you i mean my favorite way to hike, hunt whitetails is to track them on snow up north somewhere but uh but it, you know i think it's important for everybody else to know that that there are big woods and in, in other parts of the country and and there are other styles that people have developed for for hunting them in those big woods and and uh despite it, it being the best way to hunt whitetail deer uh you know don't let uh don't let that scare you there are other places in the country that you can go hunt wild um you know real wild deer that don't don't interact with people so yep sounds good hey thanks for tuning in till next time good luck on the trail